Happy Wednesday, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Uh, we have two elements at the top before we turn to your questions. First, this morning, Secretary Blinken, Assistant to the President and Director of the White House Gender Policy Council, Klein, and the United States Agency for International Development Administrator Power launched the first ever whole of government U.S. strategy on global women's economic security. This strategy aims to support women and girls around the world in all their diversity to fully, mean, meaningfully, and equally contribute to and benefit from economic growth and global prosperity. This strategy has four priority lines of effort. First is promoting economic competitiveness, competitiveness and reducing wage gaps through well-paying quality jobs. Second is advancing care infrastructure and valuing domestic work. Third is promoting entrepreneurship and financial and digital inclusion, including through trade and investment. And fourth is dismantling systemic barriers to women's equitable participation in the economy. The Department of State worked with 11 departments and agencies to develop this strategy. Uh, all of them will each formulate corresponding action plans and regularly report progress on implementation of this strategy. Next and finally, today we announce the retirement of Ambassador Philip Rieker from his role as the Senior Advisor for Caucus Negotiations from the Foreign Service, effective tomorrow, January 5th. For over 30 years, Ambassador Rieker has epitomized dedication and service to the Department and the people of the United States of America including as Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs and as our Chargé d'Affaires at our Embassy in London. Ambassador Rieker's work as a Senior Advisor for Cox's Negotiations accelerated engagement and helped build a structured process to bring peace to a troubled region. His contribution reaffirms the importance the United States places in helping Armenia and Azerbaijan negotiate bilateral sustainable peace, as well as our goal of supporting the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Georgia. As, as lead of our delegation to the Geneva International Discussions. Since the beginning of Ambassador Rieker's appointment in August of last year, it was always understood and expected that he would serve in this position on a short-term basis until the end of last year. Ambassador Rieker's departure in no way undermines the United States' commitment to promoting a secure, stable, democratic, prosperous, and peaceful future for the South Caucasus region. The United States continues to engage bilaterally with like-minded partners like the European Union and through international organizations like the OSCE to facilitate direct dialogue between Azerbaijan and Armenia and to find solutions to all outstanding issues related to or resulting from the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Ambassador Rico's extraordinary career at the department has focused on the most challenging of our diplomatic endeavors. From his work on peace agreements to his tireless efforts to negotiate the release of detainees, uh, to his work at this very podium, Ambassador Rieker's efforts have stemmed the tides of conflict and changed lives for the better. On behalf of the department, we thank Phil for his service and we wish him the best in the next chapter of his career. Uh, we will all miss him very much. With that, Matt. Right, thanks. Uh, and let me uh, just add to your um, congratulations on Phil's, Phil's retirement. You should have mentioned that higher up, I think, that he was a deputy spokesman. He, he was. I, I, I made reference to his work at this well, very I know, podium. Yes, yeah. yeah, but it was like a very small reference. He has, he has, done, he has done a lot in his career. One might yeah. argue that there was a, you know, Phil was actually the first person <laughs> who got up and said that the Taliban were about to blow up the Bamiyan Buddhas back in, you know, pre-9-11 days uh, and uh, made a big impression. Here, here. So, so, uh, congratulations to Phil yes, in his retirement. Indeed. Um, uh, speaking of Afghanistan, your first opening uh, statement talked about the you know, global ec the women's economic security, and yet in the Secretary's speech, there was one, a one word mention of Afghanistan in a one sentence. Uh, why not highlight this a little bit more, considering you have expressed deep concern and reservations about uh, about the situation for women and girls in Afghanistan? And uh, you know, you know, this 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 would have seemed like a uh, a good opportunity to say something a little bit more than a clause. 
So a couple of things on this, Matt. The event this morning was to launch the U.S. strategy on global women's economic security. Uh, this is an agenda that, as I detailed at the top, has several proactive and affirmative elements. Unfortunately, uh, our work when it comes to supporting the women and girls of Afghanistan right now is focused first and foremost on seeking to mitigate the harms that the Taliban has inflicted uh, on the women and girls of Afghanistan. This is a strategy that applies to women and girls around the world, uh, to developed countries, developing countries alike. It is uh, with a, a great degree of remorse that we say that women and girls in Afghanistan are unfortunately in a category uh, unto their own. And there is one actor that is responsible for, for placing them in that category, that is the Taliban. The steps, successive steps that the Taliban has taken over the course of recent months, first uh, with the edict banning girls from receiving secondary education, most recently with the edict uh, banning international NGOs from working uh, with uh, female humanitarian aid workers. These are steps that the secretary has weighed in on in his own voice. These are actions that the secretary, of course, is engaged on. The department as a whole is also engaged on them. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, at some length, we are working with our partners throughout uh, the government and also uh, with like-minded partners around the world uh, to devise an appropriate set of consequences that register uh, our condemnation for uh, this outrageous edict uh, on the part of the Taliban while also uh, protecting our status as uh, the world's leading humanitarian provider for the people of Afghanistan. We were very quick to condemn this, as were uh, a number of our allies and partners uh, around the world. This happened on Christmas Eve. We did not let the day go by before we uh, lent our voices uh, to condemning this. We're now working uh, on that policy response, and we'll have more to say at the appropriate time. So, okay, fine. But, you know, going back to when the announcement was made, when the administration announced that it was going to withdraw, and then the actual withdrawal, uh, you guys were saying all the time, we have leverage over the Taliban because they want international recognition. They want foreign investment. They want uh, respectability in, uh, you know, in the world. And there were people, a lot of them, including me from sitting right here. That was said, my thought. Yeah. So who said, what gives you any reason to think that they do? And now you still say that. But they have done absolutely the opposite, as they did back in the 1990s. What, 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 what can you do? What, what are your plans if you really care, if human rights are really like at the forefront of this administration's foreign policy agenda, and if you really care about Afghanistan post-withdrawal, what are you going to do? Matt, a, a couple things. We have made no bones about the fact that the Taliban have failed. They have either been unable or unwilling to live up to the commitments that, that they have made yes, to the, the United States, but more importantly, to, to, the, to the people of that. Afghanistan. Based on, based, on, based on their past history, you should have known. That. Uh, Matt, look, we have never been under any mm -hmm. illusions uh, about the nature of uh, the Taliban. Uh, what they seek uh, and how they seek to go about doing that. But it is not the fact that we have been baselessly claiming that the Taliban wants better relations with the rest of the world. The Taliban, including yesterday, the acting commerce minister publicly uh, asked for countries around the world to invest in Afghanistan to engage in foreign direct investment inside of Afghanistan. That is a clear a signal as any that the Taliban seeks better relations with the rest of the world. I, I'm sorry. That, that, that's just that what they are doing in terms of policies 
not in terms of wishes. Yeah, you know. And if the I Taliban, my own the, country, the, I would like to have the Taliban investment. The I Taliban may still be in. under under the faulty illusion that they can have it both ways. That they can seek better relations with the world. Well, then why don't you prove to them that they can't have it both? So we have we have taken uh, a series of steps so far. We are considering what additional steps we can take uh, to make very clear to the Taliban precisely where the United States stands. But we're going to do this uh, in a coordinated way with the rest of the world. So the Taliban hears, uh, continues to hear a unified chorus from the rest of the world, a chorus of condemnation and a series of steps that are coordinated that make very clear uh, where we stand. You know, uh, Annette, Nizira, 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 Nizira. let me go to Nazira and then I'll come to you. Side. Thank you for yes. that. Uh, yes. I was there upstairs that Secretary yes. Lenkard was talking about Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I expected to say something more and I try to ask questions, but I don't do anything against that protocol. I was scared because in the past I did. I was scared to not lose my job in the sensitive time that women is under a lot of pressure in Afghanistan. Number two, yesterday I asked you a question. Thank you very much. I always answer my question. Taliban. Uh, immediately show reaction. And the Taliban spokesperson, Bilal Karimi, said this morning that we don't care about the United States. Uh, United States failed the war and we defeat them. We listen whatever our leader, Mullah Akhun Hassan and Mullah Hibatullah said. In this situation, what is, you said we have another option. What will be next react, uh, action of, uh, yeah, next action uh, from the United States to show, to do, to defeat Taliban? So that is the very question that we are discussing internally and with our allies and partners. What that response, what that precise response to this latest affront to the rights of uh, women and girls, but in this case to all of the people of Afghanistan, including and certainly uh, the most neediest, uh, the neediest within the country, what that response is. Uh, will look like. Uh, we want to make very clear um, where we stand on this. We're assessing the impacts uh, that this edict uh, has had and will have. We're discussing uh, the options that uh, will best allow us to maintain a strong principled position as the single largest humanitarian uh, donor to Afghanistan, while also um, doing what we can to prevent the humanitarian situation from deteriorating further uh, as a result of the extraordinarily difficult operating environment the Taliban have created in Afghanistan uh, for humanitarian providers in this case, but uh, for all of the people uh, of Afghanistan, it's women, it's girls, uh, it's uh, ethnic and religious minorities as well. Uh, we remain committed to helping to alleviate the suffering of the Afghan people. There is a tremendous amount of it. We are under no illusions uh, about that either. And we're looking at those specific consequences that can be levied uh, against the Taliban to register the condemnation that they have already heard uh, from the rest of the world. Uh, they, as I, the point I was making to Matt earlier, they cannot expect to have it both ways. They cannot expect to take these draconian, barbaric steps uh, that prevent opportunity for women and girls, but uh, more recently inflict such tremendous suffering on all of the people of Afghanistan and still expect to find a path to improve the relations uh, with the rest of the world. The Taliban may continue to harbor that faulty illusion. It is our goal with uh, the response that we are uh, developing internally and with our allies and partners uh, to prove them, to prove to them that will not be the case. Uh, yes. Thank you so much. Um, could, sir, uh, depriving Afghan people from the basic rights is a big problem, but harboring the terrorist group is another major concern, especially for the neighboring countries. What measures are being taken uh, to take on the high level uh, terrorist violence? So this is a concern for us as well. Uh, when I made the point to Matt that the Taliban has proven itself unable or unwilling to fulfill the commitments it has made, uh, this is certainly one of those commitments. In the U.S.-Taliban agreement, the Taliban uh, made a commitment to see to it that international terrorists would not operate freely within Afghanistan. Uh, the United States has, uh, in the operation that we undertook a few months ago, uh, that eliminated the leader of al-Qaeda, who was living inside in Kabul, uh, made very clear that the Taliban uh, had not lived up to that commitment. But this is a shared 
concern we have. Uh, it is a concern we share with Afghanistan's neighbors, including uh, Pakistan. Uh, in this case, Pakistan, of course, has uh, suffered tremendous violence uh, owing to uh, the threats that are that have, in many cases, emanated from Afghanistan. Uh, so we're committed to working with partners, uh, but President Biden also has a commitment uh, to act unilaterally if and when necessary, as we did uh, just a few months ago with Ayman al-Zawahiri, uh, to take out threats that emerge in Afghanistan that potentially present a threat uh, to the United States, uh, to our to our allies, and to our interests. The Taliban of Pakistan threatens the top Pakistani political leadership, including uh, Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif and Foreign Minister Lal Bhutto Zardari. Um, I, I, I hope you have seen that statement. I have, and we condemn uh, any threat of violence from any group, uh, but certainly a threat of violence uh, like this from a, a terrorist group like the TTP. Sir, uh, one last question. Pakistan is planning a massive operation against the uh, Taliban Pakistan, uh, uh, their hideouts in uh, part of one border area. So what kind of assistance the United States can offer to help Pakistan in that kind of operation? With this, I think it's important that we not lose sight of the bigger picture. Uh, terrorism remains uh, a scourge that has taken, as I said before, so many Pakistani, Afghans, and other innocent lives. Uh, the United States and Pakistan do indeed have a shared interest in ensuring that the Taliban live up to the commitments and that terrorist groups like ISIS-K, like the TTP, like Al-Qaeda, uh, are no longer able to threaten uh, regional security. But uh, for questions regarding their plans, I would need to refer you to Pakistani authorities. Uh, switching topics, uh, Cuba. <clears throat> the the embassy, I believe, today uh, resumed uh, visa operations for immigrants. Um, what does this say? Both um, does this have any implications more more broadly for relations with Cuba? And also, what does this say about Havana syndrome, so-called Havana syndrome? Uh, that was the original reason for uh, for reducing staff levels. There is there a perception that there's no longer the same threat level, at least in the moment? A couple things on this. Uh, so, as you mentioned, starting today, the U.S. Embassy in Havana is processing all immigrant visa categories and in, in addition to current services provided in, Cu in Cuba, uh, which include American citizen services as well as official diplomatic and emergency non-immigrant visas. Uh, this is a significant step in the restoration of consular services in Havana. It means all Cuban immigrant visa applicants scheduled for interviews starting this month uh, will no longer have to travel to Georgetown, Guyana, uh, where processing was taking place. Immigrant visa applicants whose appointments were originally scheduled in Georgetown, Guyana, must still complete case processing in Guyana. Uh, those cases will not be transferred to Cuba, but going forward, new cases uh, will be processed from our embassy in Havana. Uh, the embassy began expanding consular services in May uh, 2022 by expanding immigrant visas for parents of U.S. citizens, and in July of 2022, expanded to include all other categories of immediate relatives uh, relative immigrant visas, including spouses and minor children of U.S. citizens as well. Uh, additionally, in August of last year, DHS resumed processing cases in Havana under the Cuban Family Reunification Program. Uh, the, we remain committed to facilitating the safe, orderly, and regular migration of Cuban citizens uh, to the United States. Uh, to the first part of your question, what this speaks to um, when it comes to our broader approach to Cuba, I think it uh, makes real uh, what we have consistently said that we seek to find practical ways uh, to support uh, the Cuban people. Uh, as I uh, said just a moment ago, uh, this uh, visa processing, much of it is directed uh, in very uh, practical ways to support the Cuban people, including through family reunification. Uh, that has been a focus of our uh, visa processing uh, since uh, the start of this administration. It will continue to be uh, a focus uh, now. Uh, when it comes to... <clears throat> Anomalous health incidents. Uh, we have reviewed our staffing posture at our embassy in Havana at the direction uh, of the president, and we're exploring options to augment uh, staffing to facilitate diplomatic, consular, and civil society engagement uh, with an appropriate security posture, as we do uh, around the world. Uh, our top priority remains the health of uh, and safety of U.S. citizens overseas, uh, including, of course, our diplomats uh, and their family members. And we're working to get to the bottom of uh, anomalous health incidents and provide top-notch care and support to everyone uh, affected. The investigation into what has caused these incidents and how we can protect our people uh, is ongoing. 
uh, and this re represents a, a major effort that is underway within the interagency, the White House, the Defense Department, uh, intelligence uh, community, as well as Congress and leading scientists, uh, all uh, with the input of the State Department, of course. So the fact that we have been able to augment uh, our staffing posture at our embassy in Havana uh, is a signal that we are confident uh, in our ability to mitigate the risks, confident uh, in our ability to take prudent steps uh, to protect our people. But this is something we evaluate and reevaluate uh, on a uh, virtually a daily basis. Just briefly, you say you're confident about the ability, the State Department's confident about the ability to mitigate the risk in the sense that it's not, there's not seen as a particular risk in Havana from anomalous health incidents as opposed to other places. Well, di diplomacy is never a risk free endeavor. Uh, and our goal is, is never a risk free endeavor. Oh, risk free. Yes. I thought you said risky. Yes, risky. it is never a risk free endeavor. Uh, and our uh, intention uh, is uh, never to eliminate risk because we know that's impossible. Uh, our goal is to mitigate risk uh, and to conduct our operations responsibly, safely, taking into account all of the prudent, prudent precautions uh, that are necessary in posts uh, around the world. And that's what we're doing here. But, you're, but just to be uh, specific uh, as to this, you're looking to add people, we, not reduce people we, to Havana. Over the course of the last year, we have... Oh, no, I know. Yes, but now... We, we have added now, people... And uh, as we uh, restart this uh, visa processing out of our embassy in Havana, uh, our intention, our hope will be to add people so we can uh, expand uh, those services that we're able to provide from Havana. Say. Thank you. Can I change topics? Sure. Uh, you know, while everybody is uh, focused on the Mr. Peter visit yesterday, no one seems to be paying attention to what Mr. Netanyahu intends to do, which is legalize the, what you call, legal outposts like Avatar and others. Do you have a position on this? We do. Uh, you're referring, I believe, to the Homesh outpost uh, in the West Bank. Uh, the Homesh outpost in the West Bank is illegal. It is illegal even under Israeli law. Our call to refrain from unilateral steps certainly includes any decision to create a new settlement, to legalize outposts, uh, or allowing building of any kind deep in the West Bank adjacent to Palestinian communities or on private Palestinian land. A couple more quick. Uh, the Palestinians are well, they're saying that the Security Council will meet tomorrow in an emergency session at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Do you have a position on the meeting with the Security Council to discuss Ben Lafayette? We have a position on the underlying issue. As you heard me say yesterday, uh, we stand firmly for preservation of the historic status quo with respect to the holy sites in Jerusalem. Any unilateral actions that depart from that historic status quo is uh, unacceptable. To, to your question, if a member of the Security Council requests a meeting on this issue, as uh, seems to have happened, uh, we will be ready to reiterate our views to our fellow Security Council members. And finally, just very quickly, uh, on, uh, the, on a potential summit, I guess, uh, in Morocco for the Abraham Accord. Mm -hmm. uh, is the Secretary working on coordinating with the counterparts to, to hold such a summit in March? Uh, we certainly intend to continue down the Nega Forum process that was started last year in uh, the Nega Desert in Israel. Uh, the Secretary, of course, participated with his counterparts. Uh, I do expect that uh, there will be a lower level uh, engagement in, through the Negev process, uh, potentially even in the coming days. Uh, if uh, I expect we may have more details to share on that for too long. Uh, but yes, since the conclusion of the Negev Forum last year, the inaugural uh, convening of the Negev Forum, it has always been our intention uh, to bring together uh, the Negev participants at the ministerial level. Uh, again, we don't have a specific date uh, at the moment to provide, but uh, that remains our intention because normalization uh, between Israel and its uh, neighbors is something that uh, we unambiguously support. We believe it brings opportunity uh, to the people of Israel, to the people uh, of the region, uh, and we seek to help uh, Israel and its neighbors uh, build those bridges of opportunity. Uh, Lala. Thank you. Uh, several months before Secretary Blinken had spoken about it will take steps to reduce the visa backlog in India. Instead of decreasing, it's gone up to more than 1,000 days, sometimes 1,200 days. 
uh, what steps uh, the U.S. is taking to reduce those visa backlog because this is impacting people to people and business to business ties between the two countries. It certainly understand those frustrations, and I can tell you that it is a priority of the Secretary uh, and of the Department to do everything we can uh, to reduce that backlog and ultimately to reduce uh, the wait times. Uh, we are committed to safeguarding national security while facilitating legitimate travel to non-immigrant travelers. And we know that timely visa processing is essential to the U.S. economy and to the administration's goal uh, of family reunification. We've made great strides in recovering from pandemic-related closures and staffing challenges, but we're still working uh, to respond to the significant uh, demand for visa services. And that demand for visa services has only increased as uh, pandemic restrictions have uh, eased in countries uh, across the world, and people are looking for opportunities uh, to travel to the United States. We are successfully lowering visa wait times worldwide. Uh, we've doubled our hiring of U.S. Foreign Service personnel to do this important work. Uh, visa processing is recovering faster than projected. Uh, and uh, over the coming year, we expect to reach pre-pandemic processing levels. Uh, we issued more student visas in fiscal year 2022 than in any year since 2016. Our embassy and consulates in India, uh, in, in, in particular, broke their all-time record for the number of student visas issued in a single fiscal year. We issued nearly 125,000 student visas. Uh, we, of course, recognize that some applicants may still face extend extended visa uh, wait times, and we're making every effort to further reduce visa interview appointment wait times as quickly as possible in India uh, and around the world, uh, including for first-time tourist visa applicants. Uh, this year, being uh, India being a G20 uh, and uh, there will be a lot of activities for the two countries. Do you have a timeline for the 2 plus 2, the annual mega event with the two countries? I, I don't have a, a date to announce just yet, but it is an important opportunity for uh, the Secretary, for the Secretary of Defense uh, to engage with their Indian counterparts uh, every single year. Uh, it's an opportunity to discuss the breadth of our uh, global strategic partnership uh, that we have uh, with India. The Secretary will, of course, have uh, probably several opportunities uh, to travel to Indi India over the course of the year, given uh, India's hosting of uh, the G20, uh, something uh, we look forward to taking part in and certainly look forward to successful G20 under, under India's uh, auspices. And finally, one more thing on the Taliban part, if you can go back. There's a war of wars between the Taliban and the Pakistani army these days. Have you taken note of it? What do you think make, make out this? Sorry, could you repeat that question? In the war of wars between uh, the Taliban and the Pakistani army, what do you, how do you see this? We, uh, we know that the Pakistani, have, uh, Pakistani people have suffered tremendously from terrorist attacks. We know that the Taliban have made commitments uh, to um, curtailing the ability of international terrorists to be able to operate on Afghan soil. Uh, we continue to call on the Taliban to uphold uh, those counterterrorism commitments. Yes, Alex. Thank you so much. Happy holiday. A uh, couple of questions uh, on housekeeping questions involving Ambassador Riker, and then I have a couple more on the sure. You can please stay with me. Um, who is the foreign person right now in this building overseeing U.S. media to the platforms? Well, right now, Ambassador Reeker, uh, fortunately, is uh, still a State Department employee, at least for another 24 hours or so. Uh, upon his departure, um, this is an issue that will continue to receive attention from senior level officials in this building. As you know, Secretary Blinken is personally invested in this process. He's demonstrated that personal investment uh, by bringing together the, lead the leaders of uh, his counterparts from Armenia and Azerbaijan, by speaking with them. Uh, regularly, I expect he'll have an opportunity in the coming days to re-engage uh, by phone uh, with his uh, counterparts uh, in Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, Karen Donfried, our Assistant Secretary for Europe and uh, Eurasian Affairs, uh, also plays uh, a leading role in these efforts. Um, uh, but it is something that uh, we will remain committed to uh, going forward. And will his position as a special envoy be vacant or shop is closed? I don't have anything to add when it comes to personnel, uh, but I do have something to emphasize when it comes to policy, and that is uh, what I said at the top. This in no way diminishes our commitment to promoting a secure, stable, democratic, uh, and prosperous South Caucasus region. I know you said that your, your, his departure will not in, in no way undermine right. your efforts. But can you give us more, give you more efforts other than the phone calls to convince the Azerbaijanis, Armenians, and Georgians that that will be the case moving forward? 
Well, what you've seen from us uh, to date, both under uh, Ambassador Reeker's uh, tenure uh, and under the tenure uh, of his uh, predecessor uh, as well, uh, we have engaged bilaterally. We've engaged with like-minded uh, partners like the EU. Uh, we've engaged with international organizations like the OSCE uh, to facilitate direct dialogue between Azerbaijan and Armenia to find solutions to uh, all of those issues uh, related to resulting from the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict. Our approach is not going to change. Our approach is one of facilitation, helping the parties themselves uh, to sit down together in a constructive way uh, and to uh, ideally achieve progress uh, to what is ultimately a, a comprehensive long-term solution. So there's no connection between his uh, retirement and announcement of his retirement and also the fact that his latest effort to bring the ministers together in December didn't pan out. Uh, of course not. Uh, this was always intended to be a rather short-term assignment on the part of uh, Ambassador Rieger. He's someone uh, who took on this assignment at the request uh, of the secretary after what had been a, a storied career. Uh, he's been uh, ambassador uh, many times over, uh, most recently the Charge at the Court of St. James, uh, stood at this very podium, uh, has served as our uh, Assistant Secretary for European and Eurasian Affairs. Uh, this is someone who has uh, been around the world, been around the block uh, in this uh, department, and uh, it was always his intention uh, to step down at the, end of, uh, at the end of last year. Thanks so much. Uh, moving to Russia, uh, I'm sure you have seen the media reports that Putin uh, Reports on Putin sending new hypersonic uh, cruise missiles to the Atlantic. They also report that uh, the ship could also, you know, uh, sail in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, just was wondering if the department has any position. I'd refer you to the Department of Defense for any particular position on this. Uh, from here, it is not our practice to weigh in on uh, propaganda exercises. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. Uh, I have. A Questions: Russia and uh, North Korea and South Korea. First question: It was uh, reported that Russia sent a letter of appreciation to North Korea for supporting a special military operation in the war with Ukraine. Can you share any information on what North Korea specifically supported uh, to North Korea? I mean, supported it to Russia. I'm sorry. Yes. So we have made no secret of the fact, and in fact, we have provided information uh, that uh, speaks to the support that the DPRK has provided to Russia, apparently at Russian at Russia's request. Uh, the DPRK has provided needed security assistance, uh, sending this assistance through third countries. Uh, we released information at the end of last year speaking to the DPRK's provision of security assistance to the Wagner Group uh, in particular. Uh, the fact is that because of the sanctions, because of the export controls that the United States and dozens of countries around the world have uh, levied against Moscow, Moscow has been forced to look for non-traditional uh, security partners, countries like Iran, uh, countries like the DPRK. Uh, in some cases, Moscow has not had a, a robust security relationship with these countries, that in and of itself has posed a challenge uh, to Russia attempting to integrate uh, this type uh, of assistance that it has been forced uh, to seek out. And because of all of this, uh, the Ukrainians are and have been able to demonstrate their efficacy on the battlefield. Uh, they have been putting to extraordinary use uh, the weapons and the supplies uh, that the United States and our partners around the world have uh, provided to them. We've seen evidence uh, of that success and efficacy uh, even in recent days. Is there any evidence that North Korean special forces supported to Russia except beside the uh, arms? I, I, I don't have anything to add on, on that. Okay, one more on South Korea. South Korean government announced that it was considering suspending the September 19 military agreement with uh, North Korea uh, because North Korea violated the agreement 17 times after signing the 919 agreement. Can you share the U.S. view on this? Well, I can share our view on what you raised. Uh, we are concerned about the DPRK's apparent disregard of the 2018 Comprehensive Military Agreement. Uh, and calls, and we call on it to end its irresponsible 
and escalatory uh, behavior. The DPRK has continued to engage in a series of provocations, including uh, the ones that you alluded to. Uh, regarding a possible abrogation of uh, this comprehensive military agreement, uh, we'd have to refer you to the ROK government on that. Thanks. Uh, staying in, uh, in Asia, uh, China, um, more on China and COVID. Um, the, uh, the World Health Organization has stated that it believes that China is undercounting the COVID cases. Uh, is that an assessment that the United States agrees with? And a little bit more broadly, how do you assess the role of the World Health Organization? Uh, the previous administration was not especially happy with WHO's performance at the start of COVID-19 and the start of the pandemic. Uh, how do you assess how the WHO is, is handling that? Sure. Uh, we, the CDC, I should say, uh, when it announced the pre-departure COVID testing requirement for travelers coming from the PRC, uh, made a couple points. Uh, the CDC recommended this uh, approach because of the spread of COVID within the PRC, the prevalence of COVID uh, within the PRC, but also uh, because of the lack of adequate and transparent epidemiological and viral genomic sequence data uh, being reported from the PRC. It's the lack of transparency that has compounded uh, our concern uh, for the potential uh, for a variant to emerge in the PRC and potentially uh, to spread well beyond its borders. We are not going to characterize discussions between the PRC and the WHO. Those discussions took place yesterday. The senior WHO officials have, over the course of the day, characterized uh, not only those discussions, but their assessment of what they have seen, but more appropriately, uh, what they have not seen from the PRC. Uh, we've seen the statement uh, from uh, the WHO's emergencies director uh, that the current numbers being published in China underrepresent the true impact of the disease in terms of hospital admissions, in terms of ICU admissions, particularly in terms of, of deaths. I believe the same official went on to say that we do not, we still do not have complete data. Uh, that, of course, is the WHO's assessment. They are in the best position to make an assessment because uh, PRC officials recently uh, took part in discussions with them, uh, discussions that included a formal presentation. Uh, when it comes to the WHO, uh, the WHO is an indispensable organization. It is an organization that uh, is at all times important. It is especially important in the midst of uh, what still continues to be a pandemic. Uh, that is having implications the world over, not only in terms of illness and death, but uh, in terms of the knock-on effects, the economic effects, the uh, inflationary pressures, the um, supply chain disruptions uh, as well. Uh, this is an organization that um, at its best can be effective in terms of the response. Just as importantly, it can be uh, extraordinarily useful in terms of building up resilience uh, so that the world can be prepared uh, for the emergence of uh, the next outbreak, hopefully <laughs> staunching it before it becomes uh, an epidemic uh, or, at worst, uh, a pandemic. Uh, they're, like all organizations, of course, uh, we believe uh, it is possible to optimize its operations uh, from the earliest day, literally, uh, of this administration. Uh, we reengaged uh, with the WHO uh, out of the knowledge of uh, its indispensability, but also uh, out of the belief that by through re-engagement, uh, we could help the WHO in its efforts to uh, fulfill its uh, important mandate. Uh, Pat, Pat. Just to follow up yeah. on that, uh, tomorrow the um, restrictions for travelers coming from China go into effect in the U.S. So could you just speak to how those restrictions are uh, part of an effort to keep out any potential new COVID variants or detect any potential... Uh, COVID variants from coming to the U.S.? Well, this is really a better question for the CDC. Uh, they are the ones that are administering uh, this, this approach. They were the ones that uh, announced it. Uh, of course, this was an approach that is based on science, is based on the best uh, medical advice that emanates from uh, the CDC and its uh, peer organization. So I'm hesitant to uh, delve too far into this. But um, the point we've made repeatedly is that uh, when COVID is spreading anywhere, uh, but especially when COVID is spreading uh, with such prevalence in a country as populous and as large as China, uh, of course, there is the potential for variants to emerge. Uh, we have seen variants emerge apparently from other regions of the world that have uh, ultimately reached the United States. 
Uh, this is a transnational, all uh, public health uh, threats are by their very definition, uh, transnational. Uh, we want to do all we can uh, to see to it that uh, the PRC uh, gets this under control uh, and to put in place prudent steps uh, so that uh, we do everything we can to prevent the spread uh, of any potential variants should they emerge uh, beyond, beyond any country's borders. And can I just ask you one domestic question? Um, given that we're going into day two with Congress, uh, you know, still kind of in havoc, not able to pick a speaker. What's your message to U.S. allies who are watching this about the state of the U.S. political system? Our, our message has never been that uh, democracy is um, neat uh, or that democracy uh, is uh, seamless uh, in terms of its operations. But what, the, what we're seeing, what the world is seeing, uh, are our democratic institutions at work? Uh, the fact is that uh, this or, is or not. <laughs> well, no. The the fact is that these are the processes that. Uh, I'm sorry, what work has the House gotten done in the last day and a half? The, the, these are what the work, what work have they gotten done? They are seeing our democracy at work because the processes that have been written in uh, to um, questions like the leadership, the elected leadership of the House of Representative, House, House of Representative, Re House of Representatives. Uh, that is what is governing uh, this process, uh, and that is what members are uh, complying with and abiding by. Uh, that's what the world, that's what the world is watching. Democracy isn't always, uh, it isn't always without its, um, uh, without its complications, uh, but when processes are followed, uh, institutions are respected, uh, ultimately, uh, the outcome is one that everyone can get behind. But this is the first time that this has happened in about 100 years. So, I mean, what does that show the rest of the world? I mean, is the U.S. political system as stable, as it ha in a more unstable place now than it has been in look, recent years? Look, I'm not going to characterize uh, the U.S. political system. I will just say that there is a process that is uh, being hewed to right now uh, by elected lawmakers. We saw uh, Americans turn out, uh, in some cases in record numbers in the midterm elections, uh, to vote for the 118th Congress. That uh, 118th Congress uh, is now taking part in the process that is set out in the bylaws of the House of Representatives. That in itself is a testament uh, to the functioning of democracy, even if that functioning uh, may be taking just a little bit longer uh, than it has in the past 100 years or so. Uh, uh, let me move around to people who haven't asked a question yet. Yes. Um, today it was announced that Jared Gulan, the, special, the deputy special envoy for Iran, is leaving State Department. Um, he was very much involved in the nuclear talk. Um, what is the reason behind this departure, and do we have a new appointee for this position? So Jared is a Department of Energy uh, National Nuclear Safety Administration uh, uh, employee, and after nearly two years on detail, that is to say he was on loan from uh, DOE to the Department of State, um, he is returning to his home agency uh, where he will be managing special projects uh, for the Secretary of Energy and the NSA uh, ad administrator. Um, the Department of Energy is a critical partner uh, in shaping U.S. policy on Iran's uh, nuclear program, and in his new role, uh, Jared will remain involved in this issue, uh, and returning to his home agency after two years uh, is, a, is a normal uh, personnel move. So in nature, this departure is different than Richard Nephew's departure. I'm not going. I'm not going to uh, compare the two, uh, but uh, it is true that uh, Richard Nephew was not a detailee. Uh, Richard uh, was then, and now is again uh, a direct hire by uh, the Department of State. Jarrett is a uh, detailee from the Department of Energy, and he's returning to his home agency. Awesome. Today, two senators, uh, Ted Cruz and Jim Rich, they um, named Iran as one of the biggest crucial political challenges that U.S. is facing in 2023. Um, do you have the same assessment? Of course. There's no denying that uh, Iran presents uh, one of uh, the most complex challenges we face. That has been the case uh, over the course of successive administrations. Uh, its nuclear program 
has been the focus of uh, successive administrations. Uh, it's uh, malign activities uh, throughout the Middle East and in some cases potentially even beyond has been the focus of successive administrations as, uh, as it has been during this administration. Uh, and now uh, what it is doing to its own people, the repression, the violence that it's perpetrating uh, against the brave Iranians who are taking to the streets uh, and the military support, the security assistance that it's providing to Russia. All of these are compounded um, and uh, represent uh, uh, what is undeniably uh, one of uh, the most difficult challenges uh, we face. Ned, uh, an Iranian official said last week, I think it was Saturday, that uh, things are not that bleak or don't look that bleak for returning to the, to the nuclear deal. What is your assessment? Uh, we spoke to this yesterday, uh, but at every step of the way, uh, the Iranians have given have have given us no reason uh, to put any stock or faith uh, into the statements that they have made, the assessments uh, that they have put forward. Uh, we had an opportunity to put that proposition to the test just uh, a few short months ago in September. Uh, there was uh, a deal to mutually return to the JCPOA that was on the table, that was approved by all parties, uh, that ultimately went nowhere only because uh, the Iranians weren't prepared uh, to accept it. And in fact, uh, they um, reneged uh, on that deal. The JCPOA hasn't been on the agenda for uh, some months now. Uh, of course, at the top of our agenda has been uh, doing everything we can to support the universal rights of the people of Iran uh, and to counter uh, this burgeoning security relationship between Iran and Russia. So what would be the one thing that the Iranians could say this week to, you know, re-inject life into the process next week? Uh, look, uh, right now our focus is on the protests, our focus is on uh, what Iran is providing for Russia and what in turn uh, Russia is doing with those materials and uh, and wares to the people of Ukraine. One more Iran. Sure. Uh, Charlie Abdo, the, uh, the, the satirical newspaper has some criticisms of Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, the Iranian, the, the regime is, is not very happy about the, those cartoons. They've suddenly the French, uh, French ambassador calling for um, just the prohibition on the publication. Uh, does the United States want to weigh in on that? Or? We would only weigh in uh, on the side of freedom of expression. Uh, and freedom of expression uh, is a value, it is a universal right that uh, we protect, we uphold, we promote uh, the world over, uh, whether that's in France, whether that's in Iran, uh, whether that's anywhere in between. Uh, let me, yes, go ahead. Yes, yes Ned. Uh, the Libyan Minister of Oil and Gas is in town, D.C. Uh, does he have any scheduled meeting at the department? I am uh, not aware. Uh, we, we'll, we'll check on that and get back to you if there is any uh, engagement with the Department of State. And uh, my second question is on Lebanon. Uh, the Lebanese Foreign Minister was here and he, I believe he uh, met uh, Barbara Leib. Did you give the Lebanese any promises regarding sanctions waiver if they want to import gas from Egypt and electricity from Jordan? Is there any update? Sorry, is there... Any update on that? Sanctions waiver? Uh, there, we don't have any update to uh, provide from here. Uh, of course, we have regular discussions with our Lebanese counterparts, with our Lebanese partners, uh, emphasizing to them uh, the need of the need for the Lebanese government to put the interests uh, of their country first, uh, and uh, to uh, create and sustain a government able to implement long overdue reforms. Uh, critical to unlocking the international support that Lebanon uh, so clearly needs, but I don't have a, an update for you to offer when it comes to uh, any sanctions, uh, any approach to uh, change our approach to sanctions. Uh, yes. Thank you, Ned. Uh, there's an impression being created in Pakistan that the U.S. Uh, basically wants Pakistan to take some action against uh, the terrorist hideouts on the border. Uh, is there such encouragement? Uh, this is a, a threat that Pakistan itself faces, going back to uh, what I was telling your colleague uh, just a moment ago. Uh, militants, terrorist groups uh, operating in the border regions, operating inside uh, Afghanistan have claimed uh, far too many uh, Pakistani lives. Uh, of course, Pakistan has uh, every right to defend itself. 
Uh, this is ultimately, uh, in some cases, a shared threat uh, to the region, and it's one we take uh, very seriously, as do our Pakistani partners, of course. But Pakistan, uh, but the U.S. is not uh, like encouraging Pakistan to take such action. That's if I'm correct on that. The U.S. is not encouraging that Pakistan should take action. Pakistan will do what's in its self-interest, uh, and it will take action uh, when it deems appropriate, uh, based on the inherent right of self-defense. But Pakistan has been saying the same thing for 20 years when the U.S. was there and more than 100,000 NATO troops were there. Pakistan had the same concerns that these terrorists across the border conduct terrorist activities and then they go back. So how will the, if the U.S. couldn't do it, but along with the NATO forces, how can the Taliban uh, keep an eye on such hideouts? And, and uh, is it possible? Do you see something like this? It's clear that this has been an enduring challenge. Uh, it's been an enduring challenge uh, for the United States, for NATO, uh, but certainly for Afghanistan's neighbors, who have often uh, most frequently been the victims of attacks that have emanated from uh, Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan is a close partner, a close security uh, partner. Uh, we work closely together uh, to uh, do uh, what is appropriate to confront shared and mutual uh, threats as well as shared opportunities. Uh, but I'm not going to speak to uh, any plans or operations that the Pakistanis uh, may be uh, taking or contemplating. Just one more thing on the same lines. <laughs> if uh, such thing uh, were to happen, the U.S. is aware that on both sides of the border, border region, there are mostly Pashtun population, mm -hmm. and this could lead to a severe uh, warlike condition between this ethnicity as well. I'm sure the U.S. Uh, is aware of that, right? I am just not going to weigh in on a hypothetical. Of course, uh, too many Pakistanis uh, have, the lives of too many Pakistanis have been taken as a result uh, of cross-border violence. Uh, the terrorist threat uh, emanating from Afghanistan has in the past not only presented a threat uh, to Pakistan, but to the region in some cases, as we know all too well, uh, well beyond. Uh, so. Uh, these are questions for uh, the Pakistani government. We are a partner uh, to Pakistan, uh, but ultimately, uh, its decisions are its decisions. Yes. Two questions. <clears throat> Russia's special envoy for, for the Middle East, Safran Kof, said today that the United States is withdrawing itself from the work of the quartet, the Middle East settlement. Is it? Is the United States still interested in working? With the quartet? <laughs> I'm, I'm not aware that uh, we've made, made any formal uh, decision regarding the quartet or any uh, formal statement regarding the quartet. Uh, of course, uh, the quartet uh, is focused on uh, uh, Israeli-Palestinian issues. Uh, we've made no secret about the fact uh, that, in our estimation, uh, we are not on the precipice uh, of uh, any meaningful engagement uh, between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, towards that two-state solution. Our focus, therefore, has been on doing what we can in the interim to help set the conditions, uh, re-engaging with the Palestinian Authority, re-engaging with uh, the Palestinian people, continuing to uh, maintain our ironclad commitment to Israel's security, continuing to uh, advance and deepen our partnership uh, with Israel, all in ways that, uh, over time, we hope will help create the conditions. Uh, for meaningful progress towards uh, that ultimate end goal of a two-state solution. Um, do you think in 2023 we're going to see Russian and U.S. embassies c coming back to normal stuff? Uh, that is a better question for Moscow, uh, and that's a better question for Moscow because uh, Moscow has unfortunately imposed onerous restrictions uh, on our staffing posture at the embassy uh, in Moscow. Uh, we, of course, have been uh, curtailed in terms of uh, what we've been able to uh, do and provide uh, from uh, that platform as a result of those onerous restrictions. Uh, all we seek is reciprocity. Uh, we seek uh, to have in Moscow uh, what the Russians have in the United States. Uh, that's the principle that uh, we seek to exercise uh, the world over with our diplomatic relationships and our uh, reciprocal uh, missions. Uh, and we continue to work on these questions uh, with Moscow, and we hope to see progress. Well, really, I'm sorry, I don't want to drag this in anymore. But just, can you find out when you say you want what you want is reciprocity? What are you, in terms of 
presence in each other's country. That does not include the UN, does it? Uh, the UN is not because a. If you're gonna, the, the, if you're gonna add, if you're gonna say that the Russians need to give you the same amount as they have in New York and in Washington. The the UN does not constitute a bilateral mission to the United States. Okay, so it, that is right. Okay. The the Russians have more uh, right. diplomats in the United States in their uh, yeah, bilateral but, but facilities than we do in Russia. Not including the. That's UN. right. That's right. Okay, and then. When was the last time the quartet met? At, at <laughs> I was I was uh, racking at, racking my brain at myself. Any level? I, I was racking my brain. I that is a question for the history books. Uh, I don't know. Do you have an update as to when Lynn Tracy will be arriving? I, I know she wants to arrive just as, as soon as she can. She was just confirmed uh, late last year. Uh, obviously, she's been serving as an ambassador uh, in the region. She's concluding that service uh, shortly and uh, will be in Moscow just as soon as she can. Uh, Alex, final question. Thank you. Uh, two final on Iran, please. Uh, Ukrainian intelligence today revealed that Iranian drones contain parts of 13 one three different American companies. Was the department aware of this fact? And is anyone in this building going to keep a good track of the materials manufactured in the U.S. and the Iran has its hands on as a direct loss to resale? We're certainly aware of these reports. Uh, this is something that uh, we're focused on. Uh, as you know, our approach has been to deprive, to systematically starve Russia of the inputs that it needs uh, to prosecute its brutal war of aggression against uh, the people of Ukraine. Uh, and so reports that uh, Russia has been able to get its hands on needed components uh, from Western countries, potentially even including the United States. That's something uh, that we're taking a close look at. It's something that we're engaging uh, private industry with. Uh, supply chain uh, security uh, is something that's especially important in a case like this uh, to ensure that uh, vendors know where their products are going, uh, to ensure that we share information as appropriate and relevant with the private sector as well. Uh, and if there are additional steps we can take, including uh, additional uh, export restrictions, that's something we'll take a close look at as well. Just to correct the record, you, you meant Iran, not Russia. Just, just to I'm sorry. Okay, uh, 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 finally, back to Samira's question. Is the administration reconsidering uh, you know, whether or not to keep the Iran negotiating position now that we know the president said the deal is dead, unless the world then has different meaning in this deal? Uh, so Rob Malley's position uh, is a broad one. Uh, and of course, at the beginning of this administration, he was primarily focused uh, on efforts to achieve a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. Uh, more recently, now that the JCPOA has uh, not been on the agenda for several months, Rob has been very focused uh, on what we can do to support the universal rights of uh, the Iranian people, those Iranians who are taking to the streets to, to exercise those fundamental rights, uh, but also what we can do as a government uh, to uh, counteract uh, Iran's uh, broader malign influence and activities, including its provision of security assistance uh, to Russia, but uh, in addition to all of the other uh, malign activities that we've talked about uh, today and uh, in recent weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. <clears throat>